we designed these laws for for bricklayers, mm -hmm. but we now have software engineers that have to still live under that same the same set of rules when they'd probably be better off if they had the freedom to to do something else but government won't let them that's right that's right um and it's you know if seen uh, unions are another issue that we could bring up here you know sure. unions um kind of, kind of like i mentioned manufacturing used to be over a third of the workforce but unions used to be representative of over a third of the workforce and now they're down to around 10 percent in society and, and half of those are, are in the government sector and that was the same thing that um regardless of how people feel about unions and and how they operate um you know, I, I find that there are certain harmful rules and regulations and how they're governed, but there was a point where workplaces weren't as safe. So one way or another, workers had, you know, a, a higher level of consciousness to to change some of those things. And today, it's not we're not in that situation. We have so much more dynamism and... Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. Well, thanks for being with us for another episode of American Potential. You know, as we celebrate Labor Day today, we wanted to look at the history of this holiday and discuss how the workplace has really changed over the decades. So the first Labor Day celebration was held on September 5th, 1882 in New York City by the Central Labor Union. The workers celebrated by having a parade through Lower Manhattan and then a picnic in the park followed by speeches. And as local municipalities started to recognize workers, a push was made to have the states pass legislation to celebrate the day. Now, New York was the first state to introduce a bill to make Labor Day a state holiday, but Oregon was the first to pass a law recognizing the day on February 21st, 1887. As more and more states started to do the same, President Grover Cleveland made Labor Day a national holiday in 1894. But how has the workforce changed over the decades? And is the government being a barrier or an asset to workers? Well, I want to welcome our guest, Austin Bannon, who is Americans for Prosperity Employment Policy Fellow, to talk about the workforce and the changes we've seen over the decades. Uh, Austin, thanks for being with us. It's great to be here. So let's talk about how the workforce has changed since Labor Day became a national holiday. Yeah, well, much slower internet connection speeds in, uh, in 1894. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had a manufacturing society. Uh, over a third of the workforce worked in manufacturing and just about as many in agriculture. So it was a very physical workforce, um, you know, much different than today. It's about 10% for manufacturing. And then those who work in that space have much safer conditions. The technology does a lot of the work for them and they have to be sophisticated and skilled, but it's different than having, you know, potential, you know, loss of limbs and, and, and a lot of uh, danger in the workplace that, that people faced, you know, more than a hundred years ago. Right. Yeah. The workforce has really changed now. I mean, obviously we're doing different things. There's a lot of new sectors to the economy than there were back then. Um, are we having more people start to move into like ind independent contractor status or kind of the self-employment space? Yeah. I mean, small businesses, which uh, are also independent contractors in many instances, um, independent contracting has taken off a lot. And a lot of that has to do with technology. People can be reached more easily. If you're an ind individual that's trying to provide services, now you can use the internet, you can use digital marketplaces to, to find customers. And that was difficult if, if you were trying to do that on your own before, other than some word of mouth. So there's a lot of reason that it's grown for that reason. Um, the pandemic era, just a, you know, a few years ago, people all of a sudden needed a lot of flexibility. There were government shuts down, so they couldn't do their traditional jobs the same way. Uh, they just started to learn there's a lot of flexibility. They can Zoom and, and you know use Microsoft Teams and, and do video chats with people. Uh, they can do a lot of things remotely, so that even the regular workplace changed. But we're talking about well over 70 million people that do some amount of freelancing now in the American economy. Some of those are doing that full time as their primary income and others are branching out, maybe going to start a new business uh, or, or, or earn some side income for their family. Right. Let's talk about COVID and how that really did change. I mean, it, I, I, has there ever been a bigger disruptor to the labor force than 
what happened through COVID? I mean, it seems like as we came out of COVID, work looked very, very different for a lot of people than it did going into COVID. Absolutely. And you can even just look at one industry, delivery. Everybody orders things and has them right. delivered. Food, yeah. you know, all of your, your clothing, all your shopping, not just Amazon, but you know, countless businesses have reoriented. And so a lot of the independent work that we see, it, it isn't just this. In fact, independent work is every industry imaginable, but there's a lot more in regards to that. And as I said, people can work remotely at their homes. They found out technology allows them to bring the office home uh, certain you're not going to manufacture at home. You know, there's some jobs that, that you're going to do in person, uh, but so many of them now we, we can spend some time, you know, interacting with our peers at, at a workplace, but do a lot of work productively elsewhere. Yeah. I'm even thinking of that, like my own life. I, I rarely go into a grocery store in, anymore, like to a Walmart or something like that. Maybe if I just need something that's an emergency, but I think back that didn't that that really like the pickup at a at a grocery store was kind of just getting started in some places before the pandemic and then after the pandemic that's I mean I bet you most people shop that way now right it's it's super common you're right um, you said maybe it's the last minute and you go pick something up but you know I can look on my phone and just shop right there as my children kind of drive me up a wall at home but it's better to deal with them at home <laughs> than in the store right so. There's lots of people, as you mentioned, lots of sectors of the economy too, that are moving into the independent contractor space. Let's talk about some of those because that's that's an important aspect. We don't want work to be what government defines it as, right? We want people to be able to work in the way they choose to work. That's what freedom and liberty is about, right? And so let's talk about that. Like there are some people who choose to be independent contractors. That's what they want to be, right? Absolutely. There's a lot of reasons to do it. Um, you know, for one, people can actually earn more income in many instances. Um, for two, they get to really focus on their specialization, what their skill set is. Um, you know, they can provide that service for multiple people, maybe instead of doing a range of roles at one place. Um, they also get to control their schedules. This is a big part of it, the flexibility. Uh, it's, you know, working mothers that don't want to leave the workforce when they're raising children. It's someone with disabilities that can't work a normal nine to five job, but they have plenty of talents. They just can't do it the same way a traditional workplace looks. Uh, and then it's entrepreneurs. Um, even organizations like Pew Foundation had, had found a, a healthy amount of small businesses form. In fact, almost half of them are, are just somebody breaks out independently. So this is the kind of work where, you know, it's every industry. It's, it's doctors, it's lawyers, it's realtors, it's yoga instructors, it's writers and photographers and accountants and truckers and delivery drivers. You know, there's people who perform services and it's great because if you have a business, sometimes you need a service provided, but you're not gonna hire someone full-time. You don't need a full-time lawyer. You don't need a full-time writer. You know, maybe you wanna do a little advertising pitch. Well, you bring in someone who specializes in that and has a passion for helping you with that. Instead of having to, you know, hire someone or lay them off, right. you're just allowing their skill set to enhance your business and they're enhanced because they get to do what they're passionate about. Yeah. So there's so, and when I think about independent contractors, I think of, I think of Uber, right. And Uber drivers. And I've met so many Uber drivers who tell me they love driving uh, for Uber or Lyft or one of the rideshare companies because they have that flexibility. Like they literally will, will say, Nope, I just turn it on and I go, and then when I'm done, I just turn it off and, you know, it could be two hours, it could be 10 hours, whatever I choose to do in, in that time period. That flexibility to some people, that's, that's worth a lot, right? Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it, it redefines your life, the, the type of, of life you can live with your family, the flexibility we have. Right. Um, obviously, there's a lot of distractions in the world today. But even for that reason, people, you know, seek more opportunities for entertainment or, or flexibility and they still are passionate about doing work, but they can pick those yeah. hours, right? If you can't sleep and you're an Uber driver, I'm just going to go turn my car on <laughs> at, at 11 p.m. Someone's getting home from the airport. Let's go do it. Or I'm going to give a ride to someone going right. into work this morning when they have even when they have another job. And that's just, you know, brilliant flexibility. Yeah. So why do we have politicians that are trying to um, trying to change that or define it for, for people and make work what it was 100 years ago, right? Or 50 years ago works different now uh, because people should have the freedom to choose that. But we have politicians, whether they're, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of local city councils or, or uh, 
town councils that, that have tried to ban Uber or have tried to help monopolies of taxi cab companies, whatever. But there's also like federal legislators that have tried to define work in a certain way. Why, why do they do that in your mind? Well, I asked that question, so <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll keep asking that question you know, long after we have this sure. conversation too. But um, you know, I think there's some good intent behind it. There's also special interests. Sure. There are people who will support their, you know, preserve, preservation of their industry or, or some sort of connection. But um, you know, there is a discussion, oh, the independent contractors, they're being exploited. Instead of getting the benefits of a regular worker, somebody's trying to you know, make their workforce just all independent. They're not going to get health benefits. They're not going to have access to the things traditional workers get. Uh, they're not going to have workplace protections. Um, so those are some arguments. Uh, you know, I'm going to point out the fact that, well, it's actually government that created barriers to the extent sure. those arguments are, are true. Um, and yet I'll also note the Bureau of Labor Statistics, a federal agency, shortly before the pandemic, they had interviewed independent contractors and, and done a survey and nine out of 10 would never return to traditional work uh, if they can continue their, their independent sure. career. So despite me, you know, airing the, the fact that there are some things that we can improve and AFP is working to do that, you know, the, the benefits far outweigh the, any, any cost of that. Yeah. Well, and I, I think of, let's say a military retiree, maybe, um, you know, they have their health benefits, right? Or a veteran, maybe they get their veterans benefits from the VA or, you know, from a private provider, but it's paid for by the, by the veterans administration. That the healthcare may not be an issue for them in the workforce, right? So they may value that flexibility more than they would value health benefits, for instance. I mean, isn't that really what this is about is individuals making that choice rather than government forcing people into a certain kind of work? It's very much about contract freedom, that flexibility. And, and by the way, we'd like to see traditional work a little more flexible as well. We don't like this distinct notion that you're a self-employed independent contractor or you're a traditional employee. You know, we know there's flexibility that, that could be improved on both sides and a lot of red tape regulations get in the way of that. But that's, you know, you're getting to the, the point here. There, there's so much you can gain from this flexibility. And, you know, again, things need to be done in society and people want to earn income and they, and they want to create value and, and they know that's where they will earn, earn income. So when you create more flexibility, you have more innovation. Um, you know, technology has certainly helped a lot of these things rise like Uber. It's, it's different than going on the street corner and, and waving and hoping the cab sees you. Now you can, you know, know somebody's coming up and, and you have that technology. So, you know, people are taking advantage of that. And why would we hold that back when it's, it's also better for customers? It's not just the people who work. All of us are better off by these right. services that we receive. Right. And to, to block that for perceived benefits that people are not even asking for right. in many instances, it's, you know, it's difficult for me yeah. to understand. And that's why we're working hard to, to right. change that. Yeah, I I uh, just I talked to somebody the other day who was uh, it was a, a a spouse of a firefighter, and she said, you know, my husband will go work like two days, and he'll stay there, and he works you know forty eight hours in two and a half days or whatever, um, and then he comes home. She says, you know, because I'm I drive for Uber, I can go work when he's working. And I can get, you know, many of my hours in, but then when he's home, I have the flexibility. If I worked for a company, I would not have that flexibility. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about is, is allowing people that, and that's, I mean, that quality of life that you have with your family, I mean, that should be choices that, that people are making rather than government. Yes. Absolutely. There's, there's no reason that you can't, you know, live well at the workplace yeah. and, and, and your home and have those better integrated. And there's right. so many opportunities to do that now. Um, unfortunately, I think you alluded to this, but a lot of our, our laws, our regulations date back 80, 90 years. The National Labor Relations Act was in 1935, the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, and a lot of other similar bills that essentially, you know, when they were enacted, it, it was a completely different world. Right. And there's adjustments, regulatory adjustments, but they don't really keep up with how much we've had a shift in society. Yeah. So industries are are changing. Um, work is changing, but it sounds like the laws uh, that's, that oversee that work in the United States isn't changing as uh, to keep up. And that's what you're really talking about here is kind of modernizing some of those, some of those workforce laws, right? Yeah. There, there's 
you know, essentially what we call it, them employment tests. It sounds straightforward and, and it is yeah. it's straightforward to understand the idea. It's not straightforward to pass these employment tests, but governments, but at the federal level, different agencies at the state level, different agencies, they make a, a criteria that you have to meet just to work independently. It's not just you saying I'm satisfied and a business, a client saying we're satisfied. Let's do this. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. Instead, you have to meet this criteria. And some states are particularly bad. California has what's called an ABC test. A number of other states do. Um, it's been a, a priority of the current administration to implement something like that through uh, a legislation called the PRO Act, but also independently. And this is essentially this idea of you're guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak negatively about traditional employment like you're guilty of something, but it's to say that you have to prove 100% through all this criteria that you can be independent rather than letting the first question is, do you want to be independent, um, you know, lead the way. Yeah. And so that's, uh, you know, thankfully there are still, as I said, tens of millions of people doing this, but they've been under threat because the regulations are actually getting worse, not better. And there are so many more opportunities that would be out there if, if we updated these rules. Yeah. So when you talk about updating these rules, what, what do you think needs to be done? I guess it, let's start with the federal level. What should the federal government do to, to update these rules? Yeah. So, um, you know, part of it, I mentioned the benefits. So there's, there's a, a barrier to businesses providing benefits to independent contractors. And this is something they could do. They have scalability. They already have employees. They offer health plans. There's, there's limitations because of these employment tests where you can't do something like that. So it's literally the government that's preventing it, not the company itself. That's right. So Uber could offer benefits uh, if, if it was up to Uber, but because it's the government, they won't allow them to. That's right. Because they think it's a, you know, this is sort of evasion tactic to, to have independent contractors rather than traditional employees, right. despite all I've told you about the, the satisfaction yeah. of the workers right. and the relationship. Um, and then the tests themselves, you know, I've, I've alluding to this, but workers should have more of a say when they want that. When they, a lot of times they'll create a, a small business, an LLC, and they operate under that. But the questions, you know, there's, there's concerns, for instance, agencies will say, well, do you get most of your income from one source? Well, what if someone does? What if for a period of time, there's enough work through one entity, why would that stop somebody from being an independent contractor? And yet that's something that dings against somebody. Um, or do they have enough specialization? Is this work that other people could do? Um, you know, why would that matter? And, and you start to argue as well, is it, is it the usual course of business, um, you know, for somebody that the business, you know, they, they always have goods that need to be delivered. So isn't this person delivering these goods? Don't they have to be an employee instead of an independent contractor? Because this business relies on delivery, but logistics are totally different than making something. Mm -hmm. And yet agencies will say, no, you need to be an employee because of that. Yeah. In fact, there is a, um, and there are a lot of stories like this, but I, I had heard in, in, in a different podcast, there was a trucker in California, a multi-generational Californian. He lost his American dream to live in California. And he might be better off having moved to Texas, which is right. where he went in certain regards. Yeah. But again, he had pride in, in, in growing up in California, but his independent trucking business was undermined. He couldn't operate it anymore in California. So he had to move despite businesses in California needing his services and him being happy to provide them. The government stepped in and said, that's not an acceptable you know, form of employment sure. in our state anymore. Yeah. And that's, you know, it gets, it gets worse than that because he, he found a safe landing, right? But um, that's, you know, still it's heartbreaking to see someone lose right. their passion to live somewhere. Yeah, it is. You, you talked about truck drivers, but also I think over, uh, over the years from 1930s or, you know, even before then late uh, 1800s, when some of these laws were implemented to today, we have a much more skilled workforce. Um, are there some sectors of the economy that it should just literally be the free market that decides this? There should be like no government involvement in it. It wouldn't, wouldn't workers actually be better off if they just were out, were out on the free market deciding what their value is and a company deciding that, you know, we're going to pay you this, wouldn't they be better off some of them? Yeah, but I, I think that's the argument for every sector, right? Sure, and it's, of course. it's uh, difficult to pick a, a winner and loser for right. who deserves the free market because that's a, a benefit everywhere. Um, you know, but, it's, but I guess my point is a lot of these things were set up at a time when we just didn't have the kind of skilled workforce that we have today, right? That's right. I mean, and it was brick and mortar, right? It, you weren't, yeah, right. weren't going to switch from one job to another in your town. What other job was there going yeah. to be if you were in a manufacturing plant and, and, a, and 
you worked on an assembly line doing a particular role. It, it's not like you could walk out and say, I have 22 options in my city. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's, that's well, a big I mean, part I of it. I think we, we design, I guess my point is we designed these laws for, for bricklayers, mm -hmm. but we now have software engineers that have to still live under that same, the same set of rules when they'd probably be better off if they had the freedom to, to do something else, but government won't let them. That's right. That's right. Um, and it's, you know, if, Seen, uh, unions are another issue that we could bring up here. You know, sure. unions, um, kind, of, kind of like I mentioned, manufacturing used to be over a third of the workforce, but unions used to be representative of over a third of the workforce. And now they're down to around 10% in society. And, and half of those are, are in the government sector. And that was the same thing. That, um, regardless of how people feel about unions and, and how they operate, um, you know, I, I find that there are certain harmful rules and regulations and how they're governed. But there was a point where workplaces weren't as safe. So one way or another, workers had you know a, a higher level of consciousness to to change some of those things. And today, it's not we're not in that situation. We have so much more dynamism, and we're not facing those same kind of threats or barriers or or corruption between businesses and, and workers um, or, or corruption between businesses and government. Different types, yes, but um, not not in the same type of, of collusion where, where safety was really undermined. Yeah, there's a bill before Congress called the Working Families Flexibility Act. Uh, talk about what that bill does, and then let's talk about some of the misconceptions about it. Yeah, it's uh, it's called this because it actually does provide flexibility, um, allows people more family time, but it's a very simple concept. Federal employees already enjoy this, and it's very popular amongst federal employees, even federal unions, members of Congress, and yet we're having a hard time getting enacted in the, in the private sector. But instead of just having an option to accumulate time and a half pay when you work overtime hours, you have the alternative of collecting time and a half paid leave so you can use it as vacation. Maybe there's a busy work week um, or there's a, a big push, there's a big sales push at your business and, and your boss says, would you mind you know, working a little extra this week? And in return, you say, well, can I have some time off with my family next week? We'd like to take a little vacation. Well, perfect, but not today. You can't do it that way. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a burden because sometimes a business also We'll work, you'll work more overtime at one point, but there isn't necessarily more work or some way to offset that later. Um, so, you know, this is a, a policy that, again, technically has bipartisan support, and yet it hasn't gotten bipartisan interest yeah. to, to be advanced. So if this bill were to pass, a worker would have the, the, the choice, the option to choose between those two? Is that right? That's right. The worker in, in the business could, could settle on what the, the best policy would be for them. And I think you were talking about maybe some misperceptions about it. I think there's this idea that workers might be exploited. Oh, they're going to promise you vacation and then not let you take it. Um, well, actually, if you don't get vacation for any reason, let's say you, you yeah. decide to quit that job sure. and move on, then you actually are owed a, what you originally sure. would have been in terms of pay. Yeah. So you sort of log those hours. I have 22 hours of overtime. I plan on taking 33 hours of, of paid leave at some point, or you'll get paid for 30, you know, 22 hours, right. time and a half pay if, if you have a, a severance from the business. Right. So, I mean, this seems like such a logical thing for, uh, for anyone to believe in. As you mentioned, federal workers can do it right now. Um, there's unions, federal employee unions that support this. What, 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 is, the, what is the holdup? Uh, I don't understand. What is the argument against doing it? There's some notion that, that businesses can't be trusted the same way government agencies can be in administering this. <laughs> yeah. um, well, that's fairy tale land to think you can't trust a business. You got to trust a government agency more than a business. No American would, would right. probably buy And there that. are good actors and bad actors. Yeah. And we have lots of rules and regulations to, to govern businesses. And yet workers know yeah. there's a difference. There's a lot of businesses that compete in the same industry and they treat workers differently. They pay them differently. And the cream rises to the top, right? The better businesses that have, uh, you know, treat their workforce better, they end up being yeah. the successful in the long term. So this would be the same thing where the ones who embrace this and, and do it properly um, will have a much better workforce. And, yeah. and those who try to, to skirt it or, or, or misuse it, then they, they're held accountable. We're not against people being held accountable for, for breaking laws or, or not upholding their end of the contract. Yeah, but I want to be clear on this. They're, they're, so workers today don't have that option in, if they're private sector. They don't have that option because there are politicians in Washington who won't give them that option, that freedom, that choice. So we talk about people being for freedom, for choice, for individual choices. 
they're being held back by government right now is creating that barrier so that they can't make that decision. They're prohibited from it, right? That's right. And it's a tweak. We're not talking about a thousand page rewrite of, of federal sure. law. We're talking about saying either or of an existing law, which is, you know, we, we have grander reforms that we work on as well, but this is one that would have a lot of meaningful yeah. change. Instead of mandating paid leave, for instance, most businesses that are large enough offer vacation and paid leave for sure. their workers, but some of them are too small and they can't in the same way. Right. But this a lot allows another pathway to, to do yeah. that. And, and people who have gaps in that kind of opportunity, now they have it if, if we do this. Yeah. Um, just, it's kind of amazing that, that we're at this point where, um, you know, government and the leaders of the country are making these kinds of decisions, um, unbeknownst to many workers. How many, I mean, there's not very many workers who even know that this bill is probably out there. Many of them would choose this, but many wouldn't. And that's okay. Right. It would give them the choice to do this. So, um, you know, what, what should people do if they want to, affect the passage of this law yeah well we definitely advocate for it at americans for prosperity and and we set out correspondence for people to to reach out to their members of congress and, and advocate for that um you know we're going to continue to do that i think um as you said the federal workforce is still sizable it's millions of workers so we have a case study right there over time to show the success of it and i think more businesses you know, business leaders were, you know, we probably need to lean into them more and let them know that they want to offer this the barrier. Isn't their desire, right? It's right. just, it's an actual barrier that government yeah. um, puts them in trouble for, for trying to do something for their workers. Right. Let's talk about the Biden Harris administration. Um, the Biden Harris administration um, has at times created more barriers, I think for American workers. And, <laughs> you know, I, th I think as we, as we look to some of the things that they've done, they've been bad, some pretty bad policies that have limited freedom, limited liberty uh, for Americans. Like we were talking about the, the lack of flexibility in, in the workforce. What are some of the other things maybe that this administration has done that, that haven't been good for workers? Yeah. And obviously there's overarching issues, government spending and size. It's, sure. That's led to inflation. inflation. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's a disruption for everyone. Of course. Every business. The biggest um, barrier right now that people face is that, and it was caused by overspending of this administration. Absolutely. But the regulatory agencies, even when Congress can't get something enacted, they're not sitting idle. Um, they've, they've undermined independent contracting, so they put out a new Department of Labor rule. The National Labor Relations Board had its own rule put out. Um, they had what's called a joint employer rule. We're actually thankful a federal court in Texas blocked this, and the administration has withdrawn the rule right now. But they wanted to undermine the ability... This is uh, when I talk about joint employer rules, there's an idea where if you open a franchise, you borrow the branding and some expertise from a larger business like a local McDonald's, but you operate it independently. You choose a salary. You have a lot of decisions you make on your own. Uh, and that's how entrepreneurs a lot of times can, can afford or, or find and navigate a way to create their own business when they don't have all the business expertise. So there's millions of businesses like that. Um, there's many businesses that they're, they're vendors for other businesses. Maybe you're a plumber. And you have your own craft, you have your own small plumbing business and a kitchen cabinet installer wants to work with you to say, I need to move a couple of these pipes. Right. We install kitchen cabinets. It's not our thing. Well, that plumber doesn't want to be an employee of that mm -hmm. kitchen cabinet company. Right. They just want to come in and do their expertise just mm -hmm. like they have other jobs to do. And yet the joint employer rule would have potentially undermined that. Said if, you, you know, if you're moving that pipe for this company, who's to say that you shouldn't be an employee of them? It's like, I have my own business. So, but yet workers like that. So that's, that's happened. There's something, um, the Occupational Self, uh, um, Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, they have what's called a walk-around rule. So now they can do um, you know, their, their various um, investigations. They kind of do their work site, and they look for health and safety issues, and, and um, maybe sometimes they find something. But they're now able to, uh, workers are able to bring in union representatives to do these walk-arounds with government agencies. And they're using it as an opportunity to unionize workers, not to actually... Mm -hmm do health and safety. They're not, they're not some expert that's an engineer that says this, this pipe is going to cause an explosion. They're someone who says, we know how to organize the workplace. Right. Thanks for letting us in. Um, so that, that's another type of issue. There's an overtime rule um, where now they're, they're increasing a threshold um, to who's eligible for overtime. And again, it's not to say that um, workers shouldn't be well compensated when they work extra hours and, and there's, there's ways to do that. But 
they lose the flexibility. So that there are for salaried workers, there's some flexibility, even without the Working flex, uh, Families Flexibility Act, where you say you might work right. more one week and you get time off the next. This kind right. of rule takes that away. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it creates a lot of red tape and, and um, difficulties for businesses to comply with it. Um, there's a decision from the National Labor Relations Board called the CMEX decision. This basically undermines the ability to have secret ballots for workers. There's a union representation case uh, you know, at your at your business at an election, um, this um, it narrows the opportunity for businesses to communicate with their workers in the first place. There's new essentially that the NLRB is its own court, it's its own jury. It creates the rules, and then it's the arbiter of those rules. And so, subjectively, they can say if a business discourages workers from unionizing or, or tries to educate them about the potential concerns, they can say that's an effort to undermine unionization. And they'll essentially use what's called a card check process. So workers will have to sign to show interest in, in forming a union. All of a sudden, that vote showing that you would you'd be willing to do a, a, an election becomes a yes vote. Some people are actually pressured and they don't actually mm -hmm. want to vote yes for a union, but the unions harass them. They, they follow them around at the workplace or even at their home. So they sign the card saying, at least I know I have the security of a secret ballot right. if I don't want a union election. Yeah. But this process allows the NLRB to say, we don't like the way the business acted. We're going to skip the election, and you're now a union. Mm -hmm. the, and, and nothing more un-American, really, than not having access to a secret ballot, being able to make the decision about any kind of election, whether it's you know election for president or election about whether you're going to be union member or not. That should be secret ballot, known how you vote only to you. Um, let's talk about the PRO Act a little bit. Uh, talk about what the PRO Act is. I think this is one of the greatest threats uh, to our country right now and to worker freedom uh, is the PRO Act. Talk about the PRO Act, what it does. Yeah, well, I'll first say uh, uh, if I had legislation that made me as excited as the PRO Act would for union <laughs> leaders, we yeah. would, you would see uh, me you know, run around with my shirt off outside. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a tremendous um, tremendous bill for, for the union side of sure. things. Uh, and again, not for union workers, but for union leaders and their yeah, power. Right. The PRO Act is, is actually dozens of different policies that, that I would say, you know, are worthy of opposition on their own, but they're combined. It's a laundry list of things. It, it would take away right to work in states. So workers right now, states, you know, about half of the states in America have enacted right to work where, again, you just don't have to pay a union or be a member of a union to work at a workplace. And that's a, you know, a very positive thing. It, it um, allows unions actually to have to be a little more accountable mm -hmm. on top of uh, individuals not losing part of their pay to, to causes they don't believe in. Um, it actually, I, I talked about the independent contractor rule they wanted to institute an ABC test supporters through the pro act. So it would have an ABC test like California has and that would be implemented all across America. So tens of millions of people are in independent contracting. And by the way, there is research now coming out. California has had its restrictive independent contracting standards, um, in, in place for a couple of years and they've lost about 10% you know, of their workforce in those industries of, of the independent workers and and more than 5% overall employment in those industries because of it. So they're trying to impose something like that nationally. I mentioned this joint employer standard that um, was thrown out in court. Well, it wouldn't be thrown out if it was legislation and enacted. That's another thing they're doing. Um, workers lose their privacy. Um, and in this instance, when, when a union is trying to form in a workplace, businesses would be legally required to provide all private contact information of workers. No say from the workers your email address, your home phone numbers, your home address, and then unions can go again and try to organize you. And unfortunately, part of the legislation also undermines the secret ballot. So you mm -hmm. could be forced out of pressure to sign some sort of union card, maybe just because you don't feel comfortable with somebody at your doorstep um, and hoping you get the election, yet that could be a final vote. Um, it, would, it would require binding arbitration for first contracts. So regardless of what we feel about unions, if, if workers have a notion that they want a union, they're probably envisioning this idea that the union is gonna help us secure some benefits or something that we haven't had at the workplace. And yet this process, it, it's so set on making sure the union enters the workplace that regardless of what the union proposes and regardless of what an employer can actually afford or, or how they can you know, create a successful business outcome, some arbitrator, which is probably more union oriented, may have been a labor union lawyer, they get to settle on a final contract and workers don't get to vote on it. It actually becomes a final wow. contract for multiple years and workers don't get a say in it. So that is kind of a frightening idea that you think you 
have a union that's going to represent you. And either the union can misrepresent you or a third party outside of the union actually sets the contract and it could sink a business, for instance. Um, so you lose your flexibility. And I, this is almost the tip of the iceberg, maybe a little more than the tip of the iceberg that yeah. I'm mentioning. But right. um, there, there's countless bills like this and a lot of restrictions on how businesses can communicate with workers. You lose that freedom. You can't have two workers that, you know, one wants more vacation, one wants a little bit of flexibility. The other one says, you know what, I'm ready to work big hours. I love this stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I, I really want to work more. Um, and, and they get a pay raise for that, right? But you could, you could do different flexibility and you can't do that in union contracts. Right, right. Uh, this, is, this is really a threat, I think, to, uh, to pass. How many co-sponsors does the PRO Act have in Congress, do you know, generally? Yeah, it's, it's essentially every Democratic member, um, entire House, and then a couple of Republicans, in fact. So we're talking about half of the, of the U.S. House, just, just under. Yeah, just 200 under 218, yeah. Yeah, like around 200 yep. co-sponsors. Yep. And right? then nearly all, but one or two Democratic senators. So we're, again, yeah. right around almost 50%. Um, so it's kind of a, a yeah. litmus test um, right now um, for the Democratic Party. Yeah. And, and the Biden-Harris administration is supportive of the pro act Yes, passing. yes. It was uh, when, when Biden came into office, he said this was his number one priority. Um, and he's called himself the most pro-union president in American history. I like to sort of revise that and say he's the most pro-union leader president in American history, which is to say that union workers certainly have a reason to be upset uh, with what's happening in the economy. Yeah. And, and it's good to appeal to them. Um, but the union leaders that people may try to appeal to, you know, they don't have the interest of the worker at heart. They have the interest of sort of preserving and, and strengthening the political power of the union. Right. Right. Austin, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you being with us uh, and, and talking, bringing your expertise about these labor issues. So appreciate you. Yeah. It's been fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, this is, uh, this, it's about worker freedom. And we've talked a little bit about how if, we change our laws, we modernize our laws, that we can have workers who make decisions themselves about what's best for them rather than what might be best for the union boss or might be best for the politician uh, because you know they're supporting one side or the other. But what's best for an individual worker? And that's honestly what this is about. We talked about how these laws haven't been updated for, for literally decades since they first, in, some, in many cases, since the law was first passed almost a century ago or over a century ago in some of, some of these cases. So this is really important. This is an important issue as we talk about Labor Day and the importance of, of Labor Day and the workforce here in America. These are really important topics. So I'd urge you to contact your, uh, your member of Congress, your U.S. Senator, and talk to them about defeating the PRO Act and some of these other uh, issues, modernizing the workforce, modernizing our laws. And so thanks for joining us again. Follow us on YouTube. We'd love to have you follow us on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this podcast on any of the podcast platforms. We appreciate you going out and uh, listening to this podcast, but also going out and defending liberty and freedom. Don't ever take those for granted. Defend liberty, defend freedom. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com. 